Today I have a bunch of questions, comments that were left on the YouTube page about music theory. So I'd like to start off. This was a question from SP that he commented on Dr. B Music Theory Lesson 1, which was dealing with the circle of fifths and scales. And SP wrote, do you recommend that the writing practice for scales be written out in letters with accidentals or as notation on manuscript paper? I'm going to write every day for a year if I have to. That's a great attitude. What, what you want to do is actually both. So, for example, the idea of writing out the scales just with the letters and accidentals. So, D major. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp. That's going to be a, an important kind of aspect of understanding scales. So keep in mind that when you are writing it like this with letters, that the accidental comes after the letter. So it's F sharp, just like you would say it. Whereas when you write on staff paper, let's say you would go D, E, the sharp comes before the note head, G, A, B, again, sharp, note head C, D. So you could, the way I really like to do it is combining the both of those. So I'll write out the scale on manuscript paper. So I, I'm, I'm trying to kind of put a photograph, like a perfect, like a photographic memory into my brain of seeing how these, the scale would look like on no, notated. Then I write the letters underneath it so that I'm also making sure that I associate the note name with the symbol. Again, music notation is a, a set of symbols and we want to be able to look at that set of symbols and interpret what those mean. So I look at that and I see, ah, treble clef, that's a D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. I even take it one step farther. I write the scale degrees above it. Uh, actually, I probably would not write above it here. I would probably write below one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you can write eight, so that I'm also in my brain trying to put all these different pieces of information together. What it looks like notated, what the note name is using letters, and what scale degree it is within that key so that I can start utilizing that information in all sorts of ways. And if you have these scales as your foundation and you have them solid, like a photographic memory, even if that takes, like what SP was saying, takes a year of writing it out, that is time well spent. And I, I sometimes tell, tell students stories of how when I was in high school taking American history, I would, I had a friend who played guitar and he was teaching me all about the scales and modes and together we would write scales every day in American history class and the teacher never bothered us because she thought we were taking notes as opposed to writing notes. But at this point I can close my eyes and I can see the scale like I'm looking at a photograph. And what that allows me to do is when I start dealing with intervals and triads and seventh chords and non-chord tones and modulation, all those types of things that we want to be able to deal with later on with more advanced music theory, I have that foundation of scales. So that is a great question, SP. Uh, the answer is both. And let's even throw in scale degrees to boot. I have another question, and this question is coming from Spencer. Spencer's question was to lesson 11, which dealt with voice leading. The question was about tendency tones. In AP music theory context, do I have to resolve seven to one and four to three in only outer voices, or does that also include inner voices? So that's a great question. Let's take a look and break that down into what's being asked. So scale degree seven. So when, when, when Spencer says seven, not talking about the seventh of a chord, talking about scale degree seven in the key. And the question is, does scale degree seven have to go up to scale degree one in outer voices, inner voices, all the time, some of the time? Well, 
sadly, I don't have a quick, quick answer for you, Spencer. It depends on the context. So, if scale degree seven is functioning as a leading tone, and what that would mean is if it was part of a five chord or a five seven chord, and we have scale degree seven, which is part of that chord, and it's in an outer voice. So it's functioning like a leading tone, and it's in an outer voice, which would mean the soprano or the bass, then the answer is yes, it must resolve up to tonic. But you see that there's a very specific context. If it's functioning like a leading tone, and it's in an outer voice, then it does, which means, just to be super clear, if you have that scale degree 7 in an inner voice, it does not have to resolve to, to scale degree 1. It could, but you have the option. It will depend on the voice leaning at the time and what makes the most sense depending on the structure you have, the, the voicing you have. So to quickly delve a little bit deeper, because all of these questions deserve as in-depth a response as I can possibly give you. How could you encounter scale degree seven and it not be a leading tone, and not function like a leading tone? Again, I'm using the word function very specifically here. And one would be if we had, let's say, uh, a one chord, uh, let's say we're in the key of C major, we have C in the bass, let's say a G in our tenor, E, and then C in our soprano, and we're going to go to a 1 major 4-2. So essentially what would happen is our bass would go down a step. Now that bass is scale degree 7, it's a B natural in the key of C but it is not functioning like a leading tone. It's functioning like the seventh of a chord. So again, be really careful here. I'm using seven, the number seven, as a scale degree, and then in this context, seventh of a chord, meaning our chord is C, E, G, B. C is the root or the one. E is the third. G is the fifth. B is the seventh. So in this case, the seventh of the chord is also the seventh of the key. That's not normally the case, but in this situation it is. So how does that letter B in the key of C major function here? It's not as a leading tone. The seventh of the chord overrides it. And seventh of the chord must resolve down by step. So in this situation, scale degree seven, even though it is in an outer voice, does not resolve back up. You have something that ends up sounding like and I resolve that to six, which would be a common progression or, or, or certainly an option. Let me play that again. We have two, And there you can hear that the C, the C, B, A, that driving down, it's a scale. And something I talk about is the power of the scale. Sometimes the human ear hears a scale and it wants to follow it. So sometimes the power of the scale can override tendency tones. And scale degree 7 resolving up to scale degree 1 is a really powerful tendency unavoidable when it's a leading tone, functioning like a leading tone, and it's in an outer voice. But let me just say again, if it's functioning as something other than a leading tone, it doesn't have to resolve up. Or, if it is a leading tone but in an inner voice, it doesn't need to resolve up. Let me answer the second part of that question, which deals with scale degree 4, and whether that has to resolve down to scale degree 3. So scale degree 4 
to scale degree three. Let's think about that. So the most common place that you're going to talk about this, and I think what uh, Spencer is referring to, is in a 5-7 chord. So if we're in the key of C, our 5-7 chord would be G, B, D, F. Now, in this situation, F is scale degree 4. It is also the 7th of the chord. Okay? So, there's a couple rules in place. The most powerful rule is actually 7th of the chord. 7th of the chord has to resolve down. So, yeah, in this situation, scale degree 4 would resolve to scale degree 3. It's, it's so common, this 5-7 scale degree 4 to 3, that I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's what Spencer's referring to. That said, that has to happen in both outer and inner voices. It's a requirement. So as in our last example, our last question of scale degree 7 to 1, if it's a leading tone, only when it's in an outer voice does it have to resolve. But if we're talking about 4 to 3 and we're talking about it functioning as the 7th of our 5-7 chord, it doesn't matter whether it's in an outer or an inner voice, it must resolve down in both circumstances. Now, does scale degree 4 always function as the 7th of the 5 chord? No. If we have actually a 4 chord, uh, which would be in the key of C, F, a 4 chord, going to a 5 chord, which would be a G chord, that's scale degree 4, and it's definitely not going to go to scale degree 3. Scale degree 4 would go to scale degree 5 in this context. It's functioning as the root of the 4 chord, and then it may move to the 5 chord and be the root of the 5 chord. So this scale degree 4 to 3 is most, as a, as a rule that has to happen, is really applying to our 5 7 chord when it's functioning as a 7th. So it's, it's, really better to not think of it like that as a rule, that scale degree 4 must resolve to scale degree 3 as a rule, because that's actually not, that just happens to be more of a coincidence in the case of 5-7 resolving. It's really the seventh of the chord, because there's so many circumstances where scale degree 4 doesn't resolve to scale degree 3. One of the tricky things with music theory, and one of the things I try to focus on, is finding out the rule that applies as, as generally and universally as possible. What I don't want to do is focus on coincidences. And sometimes it's easy to do that. It's easy to say, oh look, it's scale degree 4 going to scale degree 3. Although that's true, that is not the universal applying rule. It just happens to be the case when we're dealing with 5, 7 to 1. So let's not even worry about that so much and just focus in on resolving the seventh of our chord down by step. We're on a roll. We have lots of great questions. This next question comes from Ask Mia. Ask, uh, ask me. Well, that I'll let you figure it out. I'm going to post that. But Ask asks me, is a leap in this context anything that isn't a scale step, and when you are outlining a triad, must this happen within the same bar, or can you cross bar lines with this outlining? So, let's see if we can break though that question down into its constituent points. So, this deals with the interval of a third, which sometimes can function like a step, so stepwise motion, and sometimes as a skip. And that begs the question, well, in what circumstances does it function like a step, and in what does it function like a skip? Well, if it's, it functions like a step, certainly if you are outlining a triad. And in the question, it doesn't matter whether whether it's within the bar or across the bar line. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a, I need to clarify that just because most of the time in music theory we're talking about 
chords moving fairly quickly. So it's 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 very rare, almost almost never, do I talk about having a chord, a bar line, and the continuation of that same chord. But in the music of Mozart, Haydn, contemporary composers, it's not uncommon to have a singular chord last for multiple measures. And you can just outline the triad over the bar line. So what's really more relevant is can you can you outline the triad and change chords? So if you are outlining a triad, let's say, and we're going to move down here, uh, and we're going to talk about, we use treble clef here, and we're going to talk, we're, let's say, on a G major triad. So G, one chord, and we outline G, B, D, If this continues to be the one chord, we can continue to outline. However, when we go to another triad, can you just keep jumping by thirds to, to, to get what... So let's say we move to a five chord. Does that mean now you could just go to an F sharp? Back down to the D, A? Would that work? Well, let's, let's listen. We have our... seems a rather abrupt. So the, the, the answer is you really have to use your ear, which is kind of a cop-out because it's not a, that's not a music theory answer. How do you develop that ear? Well, if you listen to a lot of Johann Sebastian Bach, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Ludwig van Beethoven, your ears will become accustomed to what they're doing. So there's certain circumstances where, where, yeah, you could do that. In this case, it doesn't really work because we're jumping into the five chord. It, it's, it's, it's the leading tone of the key. It feels awkward. Is it, is it possible for you to find a way to make it work? I'm sure. As a general rule, I would say you may outline the triad across the bar line. But in general, don't outline, continue to outline the triad and then outline another triad when you change harmonies. You're just going to want to outline the singular triad that you're on, and after that, those thirds will start to feel more like skips. So, uh, so hopefully that answers that question sufficiently. We've got another question, and... This one comes from Johnny Nothing, and Johnny writes, and this is for Lesson 13, which dealt with part writing and voice leading. What about the situation when in orchestra, violas and cellos, their voices are crossing? Is it arbitrarily bad, or does it depend on the style? So, this begs a further explanation of the concept of voice crossing, how it works, why it's there. So certainly it's not arbitrary. I mean, any good composer is not going to be doing anything arbitrarily. It's going to be by design. So the question then becomes, well, why in music theory do we normally avoid voice crossing? So once we understand why we avoid voice crossing, we can then see, is there a really compelling reason why we would break that rule? And if so, how do we break that rule and not make it sound arbitrary? What more powerful principle, and again, we're talking about for the human ear, human perception, what more, what's more powerful than the, the reason we have voice crossing? So let's talk about voice crossing. Let's take a two-voice texture. We have a soprano and an alto. They're both singing a melody. So soprano is normally higher in pitch than your alto. The human ear naturally wants to do two things. It wants to, one, follow a melody. It wants to follow this logical succession of pitches, which is what a melody is, a logical succession of pitches. It wants to follow that melody. 
So it wants to follow the soprano melody, it wants to follow the alto melody. This is happening at a, at a subconscious level. Sometimes you can make it conscious when you're really listening closely. The other thing your ear wants to do, and when I say ear, I'm really talking about your brain, is it wants to hear the highest pitch as the most prominent. Okay? So there's two things going on. It wants to follow, and it likes to keep them in that path. So the question then comes, what happens when they cross? So at this juncture, what happens? Well, your ear has been following the soprano line, and it wants to hear it as the dominant, the, the most prominent melody. And then all of a sudden, when the alto voice, alto voice becomes higher, your ear has a, a, almost like a stutter, or it has to recalibrate. It wants to keep following this most prominent melody as it becomes the lower voice, but now it's no longer the most prominent melody. So your ear has to try to, it has a, a, a recalibration period where it has to say, okay, do I see, keep following this as the most prominent melody, or do I reorient and say, well, i got to follow this melody, but it's no longer the more prominent melody, I need to switch over to this other voice. So there's that question of, do I make a switch over? That's why we avoid it, because it, it, that's kind of a creates a, a moment of confusion. Now, maybe as a composer, you want a little bit of this confusion or or to kind of feel this certain imbalance or out of, out of balance. So if we go and we look historically and we look at, well, where, where in music history do we find a lot of voice crossing? If you listen to the music of Perotin, so this is a medieval composer, you can hear a lot of voice crossing. So late Middle Ages, the beginnings of polyphony, late Middle Ages, beginnings of polyphony, you can hear a lot of voice crossing. And you kind of get this kind of floating feeling. This feels like the music is kind of just washing over you and it's waves that just keep crossing each other. So emotionally, that's very different than what happens post-Renaissance, post-Enlightenment. The kind of, the emotions that the composers want to express were a far more logical, ordered, goal-oriented, and when you have voice crossing, that's contrary to that. So finally, to, to, to wrap things up is, well, why would you, I mean, if you wanted to create that feeling, that's one way, one reason you would have voice crossing, but Johann Sebastian Bach is post-Renaissance, Enlightenment era, and he had voice crossing. Now, he had it very, it was very infrequent. So, and when he did it, why did he do it? Well, he, he had such a, he did it when he had a really, really compelling melody. So, if, to keep the melodic interest, let's say, the, the, the alto voice just, it just wanted to keep ascending, and it, he had no other option but to cross voices. So, for integrity of melody is one reason that Bach would have voice crossing. The other would be to uh, have a certain equality amongst the different voice parts. So that it wasn't just the soprano singing the melody and alto, tenor, bass are like backup singers, but that each voice part has important melodic contribution to the composition as a whole. And because of that, sometimes the alto voice would rise. And that's exactly when we look at the question of why would you have violas and cellos cross? Well, at some point you might have a, a melody in the orchestra, in the cellos, that starts off low. And as the, the piece develops, that cello melody becomes higher and higher and higher and eventually crosses over the viola part. But the human ear isn't confused because it's been set up in such a way that it very easily follows that melody. Um, and in this case, 
it wouldn't have, would not actually be a quality. It would be just so dominant that cello melody that the viola melody would just naturally always be be relegated to secondary to that. So that hopefully answers that question. We're going to talk about another question. Uh, this will be our last question. This is from Lulu. She commented on lesson 16, which was about part uh, was the part writing checklist and dealt with triads in first inversion. And Lulu wrote, "Hello Dr. B, in the blue card, why are we not allowed to write consecutive fifths or octaves in contrary motion? Some textbooks say that perfect fifths and octaves are not allowed, and by some, really all textbooks. There's there's no textbook that's saying, yes, parallel fifths and octaves are okay. So they're not allowed to be approached by parallel motion, all of them. Uh, but some of these textbooks don't, do not mention that contrary motion is forbidden as well. Well, let's talk about this. So consecutive fifths by contrary motion are, it's, it's very rare to find them if you are following the principles of good voice leading, which means you're maintaining common tones when possible, you're using stepwise motion as your, as your most uh, frequently used type of motion, but if you start leaping a lot, then you can have problems, including the idea of consecutive fifths or octaves via contrary motion. So if we take a look at how that might work out, we'll see that it's the same reason why we don't have parallels. So let's keep ourselves in C major just for simplicity and ease of analysis. We're going to write a one chord, C in the bass, uh, let's put C in the tenor, let's put E in the alto and G in the soprano. Then let's go to a five chord. So we'll put, we'll go down to a G in the bass. We'll move our tenor to a B. We will move our alto to a G and we'll move our soprano to a D. So as we look, the soprano and the bass create a perfect fifth. Then we move again to our bass and soprano and it's a perfect fifth. However, it is approached by contrary motion. The, the reason fifths and octaves have to be dealt with very, very carefully is because of how consonant they are, how stable they are, they, how well they blend together. So when you have a bunch of people at a party sing someone happy birthday, and you have men and women, they're not usually singing the exact same pitch. They're usually singing in octaves. But, but nobody, nobody says, oh, why are they singing different notes? Why is that? It's because the octave, in this case, let's just say E to E, is so consonant. It blends together so well. It really sounds like just to a different version of the same pitch. And the fifth is not quite as consonant as the octave, but it's the next most consonant interval we have in Western music. And it also sounds and feels really, really stable, really grounded. And because of that, if you move by parallel motion or even contrary motion, from fifth to fifth, octave to octave, it just makes it sound like one thing as opposed to two things. And by thing, really voice part or instrumental part. Listen to the example I just wrote up here. Going to... And I, my hands won't spread that, that wide, but if I play for you something that goes more like... Listen again. That, that 
I will jump out to the listener and to, to you compared to everything else around it. All the other oblique motion, contrary motion, motion by step that you might normally find when you are voice leading. When you have this leap in two voices from a fifth to a fifth, it jumps out, it disrupts the texture because of how consonant it is, how stable it's, it's as, as if you're, you're jogging along and then all of a sudden you hit a wall. It just stops things. And you can kind of look at other styles of music to understand that. Look at um, metal with power chords or any kind of rock music that uses a power chord where you're going and maybe it has a 1, 5 and a 5. And that doesn't sound like three part harmony or three different voices. It sounds like one big mass because it's so consonant. And so the reason you don't have consecutive fifths by contrary motion is because of that, that mass that disrupts the flow of the voice leading around it. Thank you so much. My hope is that these questions that are coming in, uh, that you, if, if you had that question, I'm sure someone else had the same question. So I wanted to answer that, share it. If you happen to already know the answers to these questions, hopefully this just helps reinforce what you already know. That just, you see the connections of how one chord relates to another, how one aspect of one lesson relates to another. So I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave comments, likes, shares, and stay tuned. There'll be more videos coming soon. Thank you.